Now, in this passage here, uh, the Apostle John has been caught up to the third heaven. That happens a number of times in the Bible. Uh, trips into outer space are very old-fashioned. It's uh, archaic, uh, mid-Victorian stuff. All this stuff down at Cape Canaveral, Houston Space Center, folks trying to get to heaven is wasted time. It's been done before. And you take in the Old Testament in Genesis 5, Enoch was caught up without dying. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, Moses was caught up after he was dead. In 2 Kings chapter 2, Elijah is caught up without dying, but will die again. In uh, John chapter 21, Jesus Christ goes up and comes back before the ascension. In Acts chapter 1, he goes back up to glory for good. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is caught up. In Revelation chapter 4, John is caught up. So there have been at least five trips in outer space before Christopher Columbus got to America. So outer space travel is kind of an archaic subject in the Bible. It's kind of old-fashioned. And in Revelation chapter 4, John is up there. Well, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 6, here's what he describes here. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, that be like ice. A sea like glass, like crystal. If you ever seen glass crystal, you know what that is. And the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Or a sea of glass like unto crystal. That means that up there, somewhere over your head, uh, there's a frozen surface. And you can't see through it. Uh, Paul says, now we see through a glass darkly, like you're looking through a glass you can't uh, look through. And that sea of glass on top is on top of water. Come to the book of Job. And get, uh, in the book of Job, get Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. The direction is north. Job chapter 38. Bible says, beautiful situation is Mount Zion, the great city of the great king, located on the sides of the north. Now we're in Job 38. Job 38. And in Job 38, uh, we're on verse 30. Job 38, verse 30. Job 38, verse 30. The waters are hid as with a stone. Watch it. And the face of the deep is frozen. It's ice, crystallized ice, absolute zero. All right, Job chapter 37. Job 37, verse 18. Job 37, verse 18. Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong, and is as a molten looking glass, like a glass you look at like a mirror? No, the sky is not like that at all, not the sky you look at. The sky you look at when you look up is transparent blue and you look clear through it. But the sky he's talking about is solid. It's solid, so when you look up at it, you don't see through it, you look back. It's like looking in a mirror. The top's frozen. All right, one more, Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, then we'll draw this thing out and show you where John is. Genesis chapter 1. The Bible is the only accurate scientific textbook in print. There are no others. Folks say, well, the Bible is not a textbook on science, but where it speaks of science, it speaks accurately. That isn't true. There's only one scientific textbook in print, and that's the Bible. And the material in the Bible is so far in advance of Einstein and physics and Star Wars and Star Trek, they couldn't catch up if they stayed up all night. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Now watch it. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. You just read the face of the deep was frozen. The face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. See that thing there? All right, now that's a, that's a Bible cosmology. And that Bible picture of the universe is an advance. Nobody at Houston Space Center or Cape Canaveral has any idea what's going on. But here's what's going on. You've got a universe, evidently, that's shaped like that, the triangle. 
No matter how you work that thing with parallel lines and overlaps and Einstein, all this junk, eventually you've got a universe with a shape like that. Now why is that? Because the devil said, I will ascend and put my throne above the stars of God. I'll put my throne above the stars of God on the sides of the north. Is there any kind of thing to hold that thing up with, brother? All right. He says the sides of the north. So this thing is like a mountain. Now, how do you know it's like a mountain? Because the Bible says beautiful for situation is Mount Zion, the city of the great king, located on the side of the north. How do you know it's a mountain? Revel uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 12, the end of the chapter. You come to the heavenly Mount Zion, a new Jerusalem. You've got a triangle-shaped thing here like this. And it's triangle-shaped because everything in this universe is, comes out in the threes. You take time, it busts in the past, present, and the future. You take space, it runs in length, width, and height, or depth. You take over this side, you've got North America, Central America, South America. On that side, you've got Asia, Africa, Europe. A family is a man, a woman, and a child. The three answers, yes, no, maybe. A thing is tall or shorter in the middle. It's heavier, it's lighter, it's medium. Now, what you do, a thing is three. You've got a body, you've got a soul, you've got a spirit. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, you've got the law and the writing of the prophets. In the New Testament, you've got the gospels, the acts, and the epistles. It'll come in a three every time. And the reason for that is reality. It's this building, see the light, see your body, see the thing outside, what you see that you call reality is a manifestation of God, and God's a trinity, a Father, Son, Spirit. you got to set up like that. Now this direction here is north, and that's why when you go down to the dime store and get a compass, and look at your compass, it has a blue needle on it, heaven, and it spins around and points straight north when that thing goes off. And there isn't anybody in the world that knows why a compass needle points north. Somebody says magnetism. There's nobody in this building that explains magnetism. I got books of magnetism on that thick. When you start fooling with stuff like magnetism and gravity, you're just talking words. You know how they operate, but you don't know why they operate. You pick up a compass, the needle spins around and shows you how to get home. Now that direction is north, and when John is caught up, John is caught up there. You read in Revelation chapter 4, he was caught up. Second Corinthians chapter 12, Paul was caught up. In the Bible, up is north. Up is north. Now, a southerner hates to admit that, <laughs> but that's the way it is. Up is north. And you get studying history, and you'll find that whenever there's any kind of a contest between two nations, the northern nation always wins. There are no historians that know that. You get that from the Bible. Egypt is whipped by Assyria. They're north of uh, Egypt. You take uh, Assyria, it goes under uh, Greece. They're north of Assyria. Greece goes under Rome. They're north of Greece. Rome goes under the Germanic tribes. They're north of, of uh, Rome. The Germanic tribes go under England. Two world wars. England north. Well, if that thing goes like that, and John is caught up there. Now, where John is, he's up there. And you're told that is frozen. All right, in the Bible you've got a firmament there and a firmament there, and you've got water in here like this above the firmament, and you have water like this below the firmament, like that. You have water down there, and you have water up there, and then the sun and the moon and the stars and the constellations and the galaxies and the star clusters and the nebula are sitting in there. And there isn't any space scientist in the world that knows that, because they're stupid. And if you want to get from there to there, you'd have to go through water. So they call themselves astro, star, noughts. Do you know what naught is? It's nautical. It's marine. The thing is water. When they get in that thing, they call that thing a space what? Well, craft, but ship is what they call it. And the fellow in there is called a pilot. A pilot, <laughs> that's what runs a boat. 
and up there they go through the air waves. You see that thing? The thing is water. They don't know that, but when you don't have a Bible, you have to say kind of stupid. So if a fellow's been to college for 22 years, he's a space scientist, he doesn't have the sense that God gave a brass monkey when dealing with his subject. All he knows is a little few physical data that goes on down in here. John's up here. All right, John's up here, and the top of that thing is frozen. It's like frozen crystal. Among the th three laws of thermodynamics, the third law has to do with absolute zero. And I forget the, abs the temperature on that thing. You can look it up in a physics book. But at absolute zero, molecular action ceases, and therefore you have no passage of time. You can't create absolute zero down here. Although some landlords, some buildings probably can in the winter get pretty close to it. <laughs> But you can't create absolute zero, and if you did, then time would stop. You'd be in eternity. All right, Revelation chapter 4, verse 6. That's where John is. He's up there. It's frozen. There are no astronauts that know that, because when you reject the Bible, you just cut yourself out of a lot of information. Revelation chapter 4, 6. Before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Here are some supernatural beings, they're mutations, full of eyes before and behind. They have eyes in the front of their head and eyes in the back of their head. You say, what are they? They're supernatural. They're called beasts. Verse 7, the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast had a face as a man, the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. They're like mutations. The things have wings. Look at verse 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Trinity, Holy God the Father, Holy God the Son, Holy God the Holy Spirit, Lord God the Father, God God the Son, Almighty Holy Spirit. It's a double trinity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was one and is to and is to come three. Three threes, three sets of threes. Wherever it'll come down, it'll come down to threes. It'll come down threes every time. All right, now these things are called beasts, and they have six wings. Take your Bible and come to Ezekiel chapter 10 in one hand, Ezekiel chapter 1 in the other, and notice these beasts are mentioned again. And here they're called living creatures. And these things are, have a name, Ezekiel chapter 10, Ezekiel chapter 1. And they're up in glory, and they're on the throne, by the throne, the sea of glass, north. Is north that direction, brother? Is that north out there, all right? If somebody ever asks you where you go when you die, you say, right there. It's not indefinite. You don't. When you lie down here, you don't, your spirit doesn't just diffuse into a beautiful isle of somewhere that's nowhere and float around and doesn't get anywhere. It's right there. And every compass needle in the world points right there. An unsaved man could buy a compass and learn which direction it was. All right, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 6. Now here they are again. And notice this time when they're given, they're said to have four wings instead of six. Ezekiel 1, 6, and everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings, and their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. All, right, all four beasts, whether they were a lion or an ox or a man or an eagle, had a calf's foot, and the foot comes down like this and comes into a split toe, like that, like a calf's foot. It's a split foot. Hence, when they, buy, when they speak about the devil as the cherub in Ezekiel chapter 28, the common term for him out among the pioneers is old split foot. Now, the way that thing works is that calf's foot is set up like that, so a calf, or as far as that goes, a, a horse, walks on its toes. If you wonder why a horse can outrun anybody, it's because his knee is up there. There's the knee. That's the foot on that horse, or a dog, or a cow, or anything else. That's the foot. You call that the leg. But you see, if you make that with a man's leg, the knee is there, and the thigh is there, and the calf is there. There's the knee. 
right there, coming down there. This part here is this part here. And the man's foot comes down like that. That's the foot. And what's that? That's the toes. That thing running on his toes. Now, when you get that thing right there, these these cherubim are all fixed out like that, so the sole is, if the foot is straight, like the sole of a cast foot, with a split in it. And there are two remnants of that. The first one is this, for the ladies. Well, the high heel shoe is pull up, so she goes up on her toes. And the second one is a Japanese sandal that works like that, with a split foot, one for the big toe, the other for the other four toes. That is, what you can't understand out there in Lansing, Michigan, is real clear when you get in here. All right, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 7. And their feet were straight feet, the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man under their wing and their four sides. They're mutations. Here's an animal with a lion's head and a calf's foot and man's hand sticking out the bottom. And they had four beasts had, uh, and their wings. Verse 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side. And the four had the face of an ox on the left side. The four also had the face of an eagle. Now, whatever these things are, you either got two sets. You either got a set of four in Revelation that have six wings, and each one has a single face. And in Ezekiel, they got four wings, and each one of them has all four faces. You got eight cherub that are different. Or else, you got cherub that are capable of changing appearance. And at one time they appear with six wings, another time with four wings. The only difference I've ever found in it is in the book of Revelation when John called up there to heaven, they're stationary around the throne, and stationary around the throne they have four wings and single faces. When they get moving, like here, Ezekiel chapter 1, where they're coming down with this platform on their head, picture the advent, they have six wings and each one has four faces. You say, how can you explain that? You can't. It's just a weird kind of thing. But then you folks spend all your life watching television. You shouldn't be shocked. You've seen weirder things than that <laughs> and believe in them. All right, Ezekiel 10. Ezekiel 10. These things are mutations. They're a peculiar supernatural being. They're not angels. All right, Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 4. And here he describes them again. Then we'll try to get this stuff together. 10-4. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house. Verse 5, and the sound of the cherubim's wings. All right, verse 8, and there appeared in the cherubim's the form of a man's hand under the wings. Verse 14, 10, 14, and everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. The second face was the face of a man, the third the face of a lion, the fourth the face of an eagle. Well, now look at that thing there. That time he said, man, man, lion, eagle, cherub. The other time in Ezekiel chapter 1, he said, man, lion, eagle, ox. Therefore, per se, that is the word cherub per se, is a reference to an ox. Now we'll get this stuff together. <clears throat> Here's a throne up here in heaven, a sea of glass. And here's a throne sitting on the sea of glass like this. And then around about that throne are these four things. And the first of these will make like a lion. And he has wings. He's a winged lion. And comes down like that. And then has feet at the bottom like a calf's foot. 
And you get back here behind the throne here, and you have a man back here. A man's face and wings. And hands under the wings. And coming down, the soles of a calf's foot. But over here you have an ox. Or a calf. And wings. And coming down the calf's foot. And over here, you have an eagle. And wings. And coming down, you have a calf's foot. Now those things are four cherubim. And in one place they're said to have four wings, another place they're said to have six wings. And in one account, each one has a separate face. In the other account, each one has all four faces. Now, you may not be able to get a lot straight, but there's certain things that are clear. Now, here's the first thing that's clear. If you've got a lion up there, you have a representative for all the wild beasts. That's called the king of beasts. In other words, up in heaven, evidently, is a representative of God as creator, showing all of God's creative acts. And that thing there takes care of all the wild beasts. Now, if you've got that, you've got a representative for all the domesticated beasts. That's all the cattle that man fools with. That's the king of that bunch. That's the steer. And then if you come on down, you've got, obviously, the king of the flying. You see, every one of these things ahead of the creation. So you have up there representatives of the head of everything God created down here. And the head thing for the wild animal is a lion. The head thing for the flying animal is an eagle. And the head for the domesticated beast of the ox. And obviously, the last one is man. He's created last, and he's created as the head of the creation. So up there around that throne where God is, he has a supernatural representative of what he created down here, one for each one. Now, here's the problem. There's something missing. There's something missing. There's no representative for one kind of animal. Now, you get animals like this, you see, and you get animals like this, you see, and you get animals like this, Albert the alligator, <laughs> and there's no representative. There's a cherub that's missing. All right, let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 28 and pick him up. Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28, uh, beginning at verse 2. There were five cherubs. There were four around the throne, and there was one that was over the throne. And he's gone. Ezekiel 28, verse 2. Son of man, say the prince of Tyrus. Or if this is aimed at a prince down on this earth who is prince of a city, an Assyrian city, Tyrus. Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, watch it, in the midst of the seas, water. Yet thou art a man, and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel, there is no secret they can hide from me. And when he goes on here, you see he's not just addressing a human prince down at Tyrus. He's addressing somebody in him. How do you know? Look at verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say to him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the psalm, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Not any literal king. No literal king down here full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. That is in all, verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. No prince of Tyrus. When Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden, there wasn't any Tyrus for a prince to be there for. That thing is aimed at somebody else. Let's see what's aimed at. 14. Thou art the anointed cherub. Well, there's four of them there. This one here is anointed. This is a special one. Thou art the anointed cherub, underline it, that covereth, I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. 
That's the passage. I was walked up and down, so forth and so on. Verse 15, look at it. Look at 15. It's the devil. 15. The devil wasn't an angel. The devil never angel day in your life. He's a cherub. Cherub have wings. Angels don't have wings. All right, you've got a fifth cherub here, and this cherub originally was over the throne, up there like that. And what did he represent? He represented this class, reptilian and amphibian. So, it had to be something like that there. You know what Christ said? Christ said, as Moses lifted up the serpent, in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, and who shall be them should not perish by everlasting life. Now that cherub was over the throne, he covered, and he was run out. What did he look like? Well, if he was a cherub, he looked like an ox. And yet at the same time, if he represented the reptilian class and was called a serpent, then he must have looked like that. You see what that is? That thing is a horned serpent. They have them like that. There are serpents that have horns on them over there in the, in the Far East. That thing there looks like that, but then it has something else. It has wings like this. So, if you had Moses lift up a serpent in a pole, and as Moses lifted the serpent, so must Christ be lifted up. And it had a wing on it like a cherub. You know what that'd be? That'd be every medical corps, corpsman you have in the Army, Navy, and Marines. That's what they wear on the insignia. But there isn't a colonel in America that knows that. Because colonels that don't believe the Bible are stupid, just like Einstein. And all these folks have this great reputation for wisdom. They don't know what they're doing or where they're at. And that book, take right there, that book, that book there opens that thing. One of the brethren tell me the night, weren't you telling me about you saw some kind of thing, some uh, weapon they got in a plane or something with a serpent on it called power through life or life power or something? Some fellow here in the... What is that, boy? Power for living. Power for living? What is it, a picture of a snake? Well, that's what, now maybe that isn't the same one. Some guy in the church told me about last, last night. Something on TV. But you take that thing right there. You know what the Greeks taught? They taught the god of healing was Ascapulus, the snake god. And when old Socrates took the hemlock and poisoned himself, committed suicide, he said, don't forget to offer a rooster sacrifice to Ascapulus, the snake god. He the healer. That's why all doctors in the armed services wear that thing. They think a snake can heal you. Where do they get that from? Numbers 21 and John 3. There's nothing new. It's in here. You get that right there, the thing opens up. They don't know what to talking about. You know what the thing is right there? You see thing right there? You know old Parker and his buddy down in Pascagoula, Mississippi said, have you got anything I can put that up in the uh, tax or uh, uh, you know this stuff here you're getting this stuff here something's going to go wrong the ladder will go down the lights go off or something alright you take that fellow down there in Pascagoula his name was Parker and his buddy they were down there out on a little old pier at night fishing and probably a little bit drunk and they said a UFO came down there and after they gave them lie detector tests, and they weren't out of line, evidently, and they said they got on the UFO. I don't know whether I believe all that or not, but I know this. When they got that UFO and got off, they said that on the uniforms, those things, the UFO was this insignia. Do you know that, what that insignia is or was until 1982? Among other things, it was the coat of arms for the United States Health Education and Welfare Department. And if you go look it back and find from Eisenhower up to 1982, you'll find that's the sign for the H-E-W. Health, Education, Welfare, that's the bunch that gave Lester Roloff such a fit. 
He called them hell's evil workers. <laughs> H-E-W. Or right, that thing there is a thing like that. And that thing there is serpentine, and that cherub's gone. There were five cherubim. There are only four now. All right, come back to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, verse 7. Revelation 4, verse 7. So John's up there and sees this thing. Of course, it's supernatural. How much time we got, brother? The time going? Okay, we'll, we just got off to a start here. We'll close here at verse 8. <laughs> and the first beast is like a lion, wild beast. The second beast like a calf, domesticated beast. The third beast, the face of a man, the human creation. The fourth beast was like a flying eagle, flying animals. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever. Well, that flows there this morning.